The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is a very personal game to me. It's a little hard to describe, but I don't have a relationship with any Zelda game as complicated as the one I have with Twilight Princess. For those of you who have been keeping up with my channel, I am a huge Zelda fan. I believe that every mainline Zelda game has something amazing and unique to offer, especially the 3D entries. The 3D entries in particular all being very consistent and that they are all at a minimum 9 out of 10 games for me. But no other Zelda game has made me as conflicted as Twilight Princess. This was my first ever Zelda game, and it's the reason I hated Zelda growing up. No, I'm not joking either. I had an aunt that loaned me games every once in a while, and I saw Twilight Princess on that shelf and wanted to play it. So I did. I played it for about an hour or so and just absolutely hated my time with it. I got stuck in the very beginning of the game where Link is going around helping the people of Ordon Village. I was around like, what, six years old at the time and this was a new type of game for me. I was used to games like Super Mario or Sonic the Hedgehog. These games had immediate action and fast paced gameplay. Twilight Princess was very, very different. For anyone who's played the game, you know why. The beginning of the game is very slow and we'll get into that in due time, but for now, I hated the game because of this. I wanted to actually get into the game, but to be fair, if I couldn't get past the opening, I wouldn't even be able to beat the first dungeon, let's be honest. I was ahead of my time, so I did what any sensible child would do and exchanged the game for like 10 bucks at GameStop and didn't tell my aunt. I think I bought Sonic Riders with that or something. This game would be the very reason I despised the Zelda franchise as a kid. I also hated hamburgers at the time as well, so don't take any of my opinions from back then seriously. What's fascinating about this, however, is how Twilight Princess would be one of the very first games I had to quote unquote learn to love. It was both my introduction to the Zelda series and my eventual reintroduction six years later when Twilight Princess HD dropped on March 4th, 2016. This game came out right before my 12th birthday and I was absolutely stoked. I had just recently been following video game news around this time and had followed Nintendo's releases that year. To say that I was stoked was an understatement, even though I just said it. My mom didn't want to buy me the game because I, she recognized that it was the one that I hated so much as a kid, but I was ready. I was smarter and I just needed to get past that beginning section and get past the section I did. I played and played the game all the way up until the 70 hour mark, following tutorials and guides to see how I could squeeze as much time as possible out of this game until I traded in my Wii U for a Nintendo Switch when that system launched a year later before I could finish the game. But hey, I have a Wii U now. This is how I beat Wind Waker for the first time, which would make Twilight Princess the only mainline Zelda I have never beaten. That was a very hard transition, but I do think it is time to finally beat this game and document my experience to see if Twilight Princess was worth the hype I gave it as a kid. I talk about Zelda a lot on this channel, too much if I'm being honest, so I am very, very excited to dive back into this game. I'm also doing this so I can get an up-to-date opinion on all of the dungeons for when I do my dungeon ranking, as along with the Learning to Love series, I've also been ranking all of the 3D Zelda dungeons, if so if that tickles your fancy, the links to both playlists will be in the description below. And of course, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more Zelda content in the future. But without further delay, my name is Delonic, and this is Learning to Love the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. To put it lightly, Twilight Princess is a weird game. It may just be the weirdest game in Zelda history. It's more of a subjective feeling than anything, but when I did play throughout most of the game on Wii U back in the day, there was always something off-putting about the game that held it back from previous Zelda titles. I only say that in retrospect because I played Twilight Princess on Wii U, that game and Majora's Mask, which is what brought me back into the Zelda world, and they just so happen to be, at least in my opinion, the weirdest games in the series. I love Majora's Mask from the start, there was no learning to love. I just did. But to Twilight Princess, there was some work that needed on our relationship, like we're going to a marriage counselor or something. Even when I played the game, I was quite the impatient child. Not much had changed besides my height, and I guess I felt like the game was astronomically long, which hindered my enjoyment of it. Even still at that age, I was always a kid who played games like Mario and Sonic, two franchises that thrive off of instant action. I wasn't into slow burners yet, and that was never more apparent than with Twilight Princess. To use a quick example, my favorite Mario game as a kid 
Super Mario Galaxy revolved around you walking around a hub world to be transported into a level. That's about one total minute of downtime before I'm thrusted into a level with an objective I can complete in less than five minutes. Same thing with, say, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic Colors has levels that are like two and a half to three minutes max, and that's only about 25% of the levels. I'm using games from the Wii specifically, as that was the area I grew up in. The GameCube and the Wii were my main sources of entertainment for my life until I turned about 11 years old when I got my Wii U. I had gotten all the way up to the Twilight Palace before I sold the game to get a Nintendo Switch. My mentality at the time was that I had already basically beaten the game at the time, so I was fine with selling it. What a freaking fool I was, I'll tell you that much. I mean, to be fair, I wasn't too far off. I was in the end game of Twilight Princess, but I still had quite a bit to go before I was done. And of course, don't misunderstand me when I say I had a good time with Twilight Princess. It was a huge part of what made me love Zelda as much as I currently do, but due to my impatience with the game, I think it took a huge hit on how much I could have truly enjoyed it. Believe it or not, this was my same issue with Ocarina of Time as a kid. I never accounted for how long these games could get. Uh, sure, I downed over a hundred hours into Sonic Colors pretty easily, but that was because of the game's replayability and fast-paced action. Before I sold Twilight Princess, I had downed over, what, 60, 70 hours into the game. The only game to ever top that in that era was Xenoblade Chronicles X, as it took me 100 hours on the dot to beat that game. May God bless that game's souls that forever remains trapped on the Wii U. Xenoblade X was my first major introduction to the RPG genre as a whole outside of Pokemon, but that's a story for another day. My point being was that I was not used to games taking this long at all. This game was massive. It was long, very long. Bringing this back to Ocarina of Time, as I mentioned it earlier, I suffered from the same exact issue in that game when I first played it on 3DS. While it wasn't as long as Twilight Princess since I'd actually managed to beat that game, my time with it was unfortunately soured for me not being prepared for the game length. I thought that there were only six dungeons in the game, three as young Link, and then when you obtain the Master Sword, there are three more to complete as an adult. I remember being so pissed when I found out there was another dungeon after that. So imagine how even more pissed off I was when I found out that the Spirit Temple was also left after the Shadow Temple. Those dungeons became my favorite after I replayed the game, of course, on the glorious unofficial PC port, but holy crap, I remember hating how long the game was when I was a kid. How sad it must be knowing that it was arguably even worse than Twilight Princess for me. Getting the few Shadow together took a long time to do for me. Again, keep in mind I wasn't used to these long games before. I was pissed going to the Arbiter's Grounds knowing I now had to collect the broken mirror shards to seal away Ganondorf or whatever the plot was at the time, I can't remember. And then after that, going to the Snow Peak Ruins. Then the City in the Sky put me just near my breaking point. It was just too long for me. Before going back to the game, I remembered absolutely nothing about those later dungeons because of the sour taste in my mouth. I remember bits and pieces of them, but due to me just outright hating the length of the game, the back half of Twilight Princess has almost been completely wiped from my memory, and that's where most of my knowledge ends of this game. I remember doing a ton of side quests for the game, going back and forth until I eventually just gave up and turned to better alternatives as of course Breath of the Wild had released, and to this day, I am enthralled with that game's excellence and even going it as far to call it better than Tears of the Kingdom. Another topic I would say is for another day but I already made a video on that, so feel free to check the description for a link to that video if you're interested. But needless to say, I think it's time for a throwback. I think it's finally time to go back to this game to see why I loved it so much and why, at the time, it frustrated me to no end. So, where else to start but the beginning? This sucks! It's no surprise that this game's opening is absolutely infamous in the gaming landscape. Despite me being impatient as a kid, there was an obvious reason I could never get into it. I think first impressions are very important for a video game, especially if your game is a longer one. Most RPG games suffer from extremely slow beginnings because they have time on their side and use said time to build up their characters and the world they inhabit. However, those are RPGs. The Legend of Zelda is not an RPG, kind of. And I thought 
thought the Wind Waker's opening was relatively slow. This is absolutely unacceptable in my opinion. To get to the very first dungeon in the game, you have a lot of prerequisites to go through before being able to enter the dungeon proper. Something I have made clear when talking about Zelda on this channel is that the first impressions are vital. They set the expectations moving forward and are overall an indicator on how things will go once you leave the starting area. This is what I mean when I say that Twilight Princess is weird, because I think it breaks a lot of conventions that I myself set for the series. Saying that the opening of this game sucks is not a hot take at all, but I think it's a bit of an over-exaggeration. This is something I realized recently when playing Sonic Frontiers. I apologize for bringing Sonic up so much when talking about non-Sonic things. I did the same thing with my learning to love Mario 64 video, and to be fair, it was a great marketing stunt for the video. Sonic fans got very up in arms about what I had to say, but I promise I have positive things to say this time. Just bear with me for a bit. Sonic Frontiers has a very odd game loop in my opinion. It's a collect-a-thon where your biggest objective is to collect memory tokens to advance in the story, and they are required for 100% completion. I play to make a video on Frontiers someday, a full review of that game, that's why I have so much footage of it, but it's a very common complaint for completion that you need to clear the map of all memory tokens and platforming challenges, which is honestly something I understand. I had the same sentiment as well for a while, until I had a change in perspective, and trust me, that ties back into Twilight Princess, I swear. I feel like I have to keep snapping my fingers to remind you I'm talking about Zelda. The entire game flipped itself on its head for me when I changed my perspective on the game and how I went about completing objectives. The reason I never really liked to replay Sonic Frontiers was because of this tedium and monotony. Collecting the memory tokens made me want to pull my hair out, but that's because I was so focused on the goal that I was forced to pull myself back and look at the bigger picture. The moment I sat back and allowed myself to be invested in the game's mechanics, its story, the gameplay, everything, it all just became clear to me. I had a lot more fun messing around in the overworld, not focusing on the objective, but rather taking detours on the way, and it caused me to never get stuck with the Collect Memory Tokens mission again, because I just allowed myself to take time and enjoy what this game has to offer. And I did the same with Twilight Princess, which gave me a lot more appreciation for the game's opening. Wow, that was a long sentence. This game takes leaps and strides to put you in the shoes of Link. Nintendo wants you to know in and out of what a regular day for him looks like before he gets thrusted in a grand adventure venture to save the world. Where the hero of time and winds were children, abrasive and tired of their boring life, this Link is a lot older and actually takes pride in his life in Ordon Village. It's not much, but it's his life he's settled into and he likes it that way. It's a sense of comfort and familiarity that Link won't have for the rest of the game and the music of Ordon reflects that. The simplicity and calming nature of the song hammers home that life in Ordon is simple, separate from the rest of Hyrule that's shown perfectly when you entered Castletown later in the game. A bustling melting pot of folk trying to make a living. Where Ordon is quiet, safe and familiar, Hyrule itself is loud, dangerous and new. They do a great job at immersing you into Link's world and what it revolves around. Everyone knows each other in Ordon. It's self-contained, and Link being able to mingle with everyone and help them reminds me of my own childhood, and it's comforting in a way. After I completed the Forest Temple, I even went back to Ordon before setting out and seeing how it affected the villagers. I actually cared about how these people felt, and that's all due to the game doing a decent job at making me care. I felt like I had to go out and find the lost children now so I don't let them down. Allowing myself to sink into Link's character and the world he inhabits made the opening section so much better for me as I grew to enjoy the villagers in Ordon. Seeing the children take it away and how it affects everyone in the village hits harder knowing you spent so much time with them in the beginning. Link from Wind Waker and his community was around the same way, but I think it's overall better and more connected here in Twilight Princess as you spend so much more time with them. I was focused on enjoying my time with the game rather than beating the game as quickly as possible and that fed further when I got into the game itself. However, despite the good character of Link and decent setup at the beginning of the game, that doesn't take away from the fact that the beginning of the game is just so dang long. I had pretty decent knowledge on this game and its mechanics when returning to it. 
I'd say I moved at a pretty quick and steady pace while moving through the tutorial sections, but that did not deter the game one bit from taking its sweet, sweet time with me. I like Ordon Village, and I like the colorful cast of characters that come with it, but it comes with a lot of excuses because this beginning section messes with my mind and honestly heavily frustrates me with how slow it turned out to be. You have to complete so many meaningless tasks to get acquainted with everyone and obtain everything you need to embark on your adventure. Things like fetching the baby cradle and fishing for a cat does good things to get you acquainted with the cast before you get out there, but at the same time I strongly feel that it wasn't needed. It gets so bad that they have you repeat the same task twice being herding goats, and this game is big, it's not like they actively needed to pad out the beginning for a certain amount of time. You go back to Faron Woods twice before you eventually go back a third time to actually enter the dungeon. It's things like these that make me scratch my head in pure confusion as to why they would make decisions like this. I get they need you to become acquainted with both Link and Wolf Link's controls before you really start your adventure, but everything just feels so drawn out that it simply feels repetitive, and it doesn't help that you go back to the same area three different times. I really like the forest dungeon in Twilight Princess. I think it's a great introductory dungeon that has fun puzzles and mechanics, but it takes two hours of playtime to get there. When you boot up Ocarina of Time, you have a short dialogue with Saria, you talk to Mido and learn that you need a sword and shield before you can talk to the Great Deku Tree. That's really it. That's the, After that, you're just left to your own devices to mess around in Kakiri Forest until you grab the items you need to take on the dungeon. If you know what you're doing, you're in and out of the first dungeon in about 30 minutes. It's both linear and fast paced. The game doesn't force you to go and carry out meaningless tasks for the Kikiri unless you want to. You get in and you get out. That's one of Ocarina of Time's biggest strengths in my opinion, that being the pacing. After leaving Kakiri Forest, you can enter Death Mountain and Dodongo's Cavern within the next hour. That's two dungeons completed before you even reach Twilight Princess's first, which is, oh God, that's pitiful to me. I want to like and enjoy the beginning of this game, but it feels like such a massive barrier to entry due to the prologue being extended way further than it should be. This game has a big story to tell, and I like that, but I feel like the beginning is structured in a way where they only let one thing be introduced and fleshed out at a time. There was absolutely no reason for the first dungeon to be placed so far into the game. Like I said, I want to like and enjoy the beginning of this game. I want to go in and appreciate the finer details, but all of those little problems just keep adding up and it feels like it's pushing me farther away from enjoying this game to its fullest. That is, until the game just suddenly decides to become peak fiction. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about that. When creating Twilight Princess, Nintendo aimed to recreate the magic of Ocarina of Time, one of my personal favorite games of all time, so this had major shoes to fill. Did it capture anything that Ocarina of Time effortlessly nailed the first time? And not really. But while Majora's Mask was a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess feels like Ocarina of Time 2, if that makes any sense. You can feel the Ocarina of Time influence ooze out of this game as the demand from Zelda fans at the time was for a game that looked like what Twilight Princess eventually became. And so, through their wishes, they activated the legendary monkey paw and got what they asked for and Nintendo just absolutely hated it. They shelved a sequel to Wind Waker for this game because the demand was just that high for a realistic Zelda. But in trying to replicate the beauty of Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess managed to carve out a unique path of its own, becoming something greater than what it set out to be. Twilight Princess will never be Ocarina of Time. To me, Ocarina of Time is a damn near perfect game. Its structure, its puzzles, its story, everything just feels great with that game, and to this day, remains one of my favorites. As I have come to learn the hard way, Twilight Princess is anything but perfect. It's weird to think about now after beating the game because after I laid the controller down, just I was in love. I love this game, but even when writing, recording, and editing this video, I'm still left baffled as to why I love it so much. Twilight Princess has so many flaws that I just don't enjoy for the game to seem worthwhile to me. Uh, let's start from the beginning once again. I enjoy the Ordon villagers and the story they inhabit at the beginning of the game. The game wants you to spend so much time with these characters to get to know them so their story feels all the more impactful. And you know what? It worked. 
One of my favorite moments in this game come from the side characters, specifically Colin after being kidnapped and set free by Link. After being bullied, he doubts himself. He wants to be just like Link, but due to his timid nature, he sits back and is afraid to take action. But everything changes when the King Bulblin storms into Kakariko Village and Calden saves Beth from being ran over, being kidnapped right after. It's now Link's job to get him back on this awesome horseback section with an amazing shot of him and Epona with the music blaring in the background. This moment still gives me chills, I love it. But it's afterwards that always gets me. Colin accepting what true bravery is and growing from that moment. I think it's an amazing moment for his character and something we have never seen in a Zelda game up until that point. And then Nintendo says, you know what, screw them kids, and then they forget about Colin and the other children for the rest of the game. Why did they do that? I will never understand why they made a decision like this. I get it, you know, they obviously can't do much since they're children and don't really have a lot of relevance in the main story, but they went so far out of their way to make you care for these characters and it only gets me further attached to them. Them. They dropped their story and stopped developing them before the second dungeon. Hell, for the most part, they drop about every side character when you collect a few shadows, which makes me even more conflicted because after the majority of the characters are gone, including Zelda, the game's pacing improves a substantial amount where you bounce from dungeon to dungeon like it was Ocarina of Time. Some new characters were introduced and they even bring back Russell, which was really cool, but they're just there to guide you to your next destination. They don't get a lot of unique development and I'm perfectly okay with that, but it's so jarring to me that they just ignore all of these characters you meet at the beginning of the game until they put them in for one last mission because they forgot about them. You can go back to Ordon at any time and see how the villagers are holding up at any time but no developments are made until the game says so, which for me took about 10 whole hours. This is in reference for Ilya's story regarding her memories and whatnot, as, you know, she's the character they built up the most for Link prior to his adventure. For someone like Colin, even longer due to the developers just saying no, I guess. The only characters that really matter in this game are Link and Midna, and of course they should matter, you know, they are the main protagonists after all. I'm not saying the spotlight should be taken away from them, but my main issue is where they put the spotlight on characters for so long at a time just to take it away soon after. Even Ganondorf, THE Ganondorf! Ganondorf doesn't get any screen time until halfway throughout the game and of course the final battle. Ganondorf has this natural aura to him that takes up any space he inhabits and when he's on screen he is no less cool than he was in Wind Waker or Ocarina, but he is by far the weakest interpretation of the character by far. I'm gonna say it. Ganondorf in this game is a bum. He is not even mentioned until after you finish the Arbiter's Grounds and doesn't even do anything until the final minutes of the game. As a huge Ganondorf fan, this really sucks. He's resurrected all of a sudden, shows up, and then dies. Only a bum does something like that. There's nothing to this guy other than a force to be stopped, and it's very unfortunate to see, especially how awesome he was in Wind Waker. Even Zelda has nothing to do. The entire game. I'm pretty sure she has less screen time than Ganondorf. She shows up, is seen once, and then dies. Uh, but actually, she comes back in the finale because she's Zelda and she's in the title. It's her legend even though she shows up for like five minutes. Two of the most pivotal characters in the franchise just have nothing to do the entire time and it frustrates me so much. If anything, it feels like the developers were making the game and wanted to go into a completely different direction before getting halfway through the game and backpedaling so hard on what they wanted to do. Sant was so cool, but of course he just had to be a Ganondorf lack the entire time. Trust me, bro, Yanadorf was here pulling strings the entire time. This game switches up on what it wants to be so often, it's just so hard to even keep up. Even in the gameplay, I feel this sentiment become more and more true as the whole gimmick of the game, that being the wolf aspect, is shafted by the time you obtain the few shadows. It's not shafted as hard as everything else, but it becomes far less important once you clear out the twilight. In the beginning of the game, it is your job to venture into the twilight and reclaim the light by going around and collecting tears of light. That's a lot of light in one sentence. You just gotta restore the spirits that dwell within the area and repel the twilight. For a while, this is all the wolf part is good for, and it's fine. 
That is until you repel the Twilight and gain free access to become a wolf and human whenever you please. It's at this point when the usefulness of the wolf runs its course and becomes sidelined for some awesome Link action. Again, it's not sidelined as hard as the characters are, but there are good uses of it in dungeons like the Arbiter's Grounds. That was probably the best use of the wolf ability in the entire game, combining it with the human mechanics making for one of the best dungeons of all time. But other than that, it's just kind of a side thing, and it's disappointing. So many things in the first half of the game are hyped up and fleshed out to almost an excessive amount just to be thrown to the wayside later in the game. The things that hooked me are gone or aren't as good as anymore but not all hope was lost, as I have yet to mention the two aspects of the game that made it one of my favorite Zelda games of all time. If you've been around with this channel for a while, you see me preach time and time again what I think the best elements to a Zelda game are, and I will continue to preach them for as long as this channel is up. Today, however, we're gonna go over the biggest aspect on why I think Ocarina of Time is so beloved, that being the dungeons of the game. Although the biggest reason I love the game is because of the dungeons. I think the dungeons can either make or break my enjoyment of a Zelda game. There are only a few exceptions to this rule, however, Breath of the Wild, you know, Tears of the Kingdom, Majora's Mask, they all have a much bigger emphasis on other content than just the dungeons, so they get a pass. The dungeons definitely weren't the main focus on these titles, and I will not treat them as such, but that won't stop me from ranking the dungeons later on. Although when it does come to traditional 3D Zelda games, the dungeons are very important regardless. Yes, even in Majora's Mask. Ocarina of Time specifically has some of my favorite dungeons in the entire franchise, pulling out all of the stops to create an amazing, linear, yet open-ended puzzle boxes for you to explore and figure out. Wind Waker took this philosophy and experimented with it. They took the relative structure of those dungeons and flipped it on their head. Those dungeons aren't as open-ended as Ocarina of Time, nor do they need to be. The dungeons they created for Wind Waker are still awesome, but due to their lack of difficulty, I don't think they reached the full potential of what they could have had. Twilight Princess is the exact same way for me. The game up until this point was the most linear Zelda title. The only relatively open area being Hyrule Field, expanded upon with a whole lot of nothing to do around here, and it shows. It's only really used for bigger pictures in the game, like the fight on Elden Bridge, guiding the carriage to Kakariko Village, and of course the final fight with Ganondorf. The linearity carries over to the dungeons themselves, and in my opinion, are done far better than Wind Waker's. I would go as far as to say some of the dungeons are on par, if not surpass, some of my favorites from Ocarina of Time. I've ranked the Ocarina of Time and Wind Waker dungeons and plan on doing so for Twilight Princess eventually, as well as the other 3D games of the future, so I don't want to go into too much detail on my favorite dungeons, as I don't want to spoil that video for whenever I make it, but believe me when I say that Twilight Princess's dungeons have some of the best puzzle solving in the entire franchise. It takes a long time to get there though, which is a major downside. It took me two hours, only two hours, just to get to the Forest Temple, and another two to get to the next dungeon, the Goron Mines. Another hour and a half to the Light Bed Temple, so it does make me very glad knowing that these dungeons are longer than they usually are in other Zelda games. Something that was also a huge standout to me while playing were the bosses. I don't know what it is about this game nailing its dungeon design, but the bosses in this game are also some of my favorites within the entire franchise. The only fight I really didn't like was the Forest Temple boss. You have to throw bombs into his mouth with a gale boomerang and start wailing on him. It's a weird fight and took me a little while to figure out and never really clicked with me. Otherwise, almost every boss was really, really good here. They felt more gimmicky than they do in a usual Zelda game, but I think that works in its favor as they're only really gimmicky in the sense of using the item you obtained in that dungeon, which is perfectly fine by me. Particular standouts being the Stalord boss, Xant, and of course the awesome fight with Ganondorf. Him especially having four phases, with each phase being very unique in how you take him on, even utilizing the wolf form, and in my opinion, the final sword battle with him is better than the one in the Wind Waker. Truly an epic way to end the game. Everything from the layouts, the atmosphere, and especially the problem solving scratch a very specific itch I have when playing a Zelda game. Due to the dungeon's increased length, they have a lot more time to expand and build upon puzzles previously found within the dungeons and really test you on your problem solving. Particular puzzle favorites of mine were the Ice Block Puzzle in Snow Peak Ruins, and this one wasn't so much of a puzzle but rather a test of reflexes and quick thinking, was in the Twilight Palace with the hand chasing you as you take the Orb of Light. It's always running after you, and I really like that aspect. It keeps you on your toes, and I always liked missions with an unstoppable force chasing you. I would say my favorite dungeons overall, but 
of course, I don't want to spoil anything in the ranking video in the future, so I'll hold my tongue for now. Speaking of atmosphere, that is something I think this game does extremely well, as this was the first real chance to see a fully realized Hyrule in 3D. Ocarina of Time's overworld didn't really have too much time to get expanded upon, and due to the technical limitations of the console, a lot of things were left to the imagination. But here in Twilight Princess, we get to see Hyrule in a way that we have never seen before. A completely unique take on the land Link inhabits. Not only do we get to explore the twilight bathed in this hazy yellow and orange color, we get to see new sides of Hyrule that we haven't seen before. And the atmosphere is only enhanced by the amazing soundtrack this game carries. When I played this game back in the day, I had pre-ordered the HD version and obtained the sound selection for the game. I still have this CD to this day and it remains as one of my all-time favorite game soundtracks due to the amazing variety and scope in the music. Rearranged tracks from older titles like the Serenade of Water and the Lost Woods gave me a huge wave of nostalgia as I went through them, under the illusion that Nintendo still cared about the Zelda timeline. Of course, the new tracks in the game becoming some of the most iconic in the franchise. A huge standout being Midna's Lament. If you're a Zelda fan, you already know this song by heart. A beautiful yet haunting track as you race through Hyrule Field in an attempt to restore Midna back to full health as she has been fatally wounded by Zant. Call me basic, but this track remains in my top 10 favorite Zelda songs of all time. And of course, how could we forget Minna herself? The very thing that kept me tied to the game outside of the dungeons. She was just about the one and only character the game actually cared about throughout the entirety of the game. When you first meet her, she's only interested in using you for her own personal gain. She wants to save her own world even at the expense of yours. It was only until she saw the kindness of both Link and Zelda was where she made a huge turnaround, and it became the best companion in all of Zelda, let's just not even beat around the bush here. It is here in which that I can see the story fully realized, and only makes me even more frustrated that we could get this kind of development for the other characters. Her sacrifice at the end genuinely got me. Seeing her growth throughout the game makes her more than just a companion. We saw glimpses of something like this with Navi and Ocarina of Time and Tattle in Majora's Mask, but it was only through Midna where Zelda companions became more than just companions. My favorite moment from her comes at the end of the game, where she's more than willing to lay down her own life in sacrifice for others, knowing that she would never do something like that at the beginning of the game. If it weren't for Midna and the absolutely amazing dungeons in the game, I don't think I would have liked this game as much, and it might have been my least favorite 3D Zelda. Even if the dungeons were on par with Wind Waker, I feel like it would have ended up the same way. Due to the amount of stuff you do in the meantime before and after a dungeon, if they weren't out standing, the game would be nowhere near as good as it is, and that's something I only appreciated further with time. As when I played the game a second time, I stopped right at the Palace of Twilight, but there was always something on my mind as a kid. I hated Zelda dungeons. I absolutely despised them. I thought that they were the pace killer in comparison to everything else I did in the game. I held the sentiment for when I first played Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and of course Twilight Princess. My least favorite dungeons in the game beforehand actually ended ended up being my favorites when I come back today, which is just such a weird turnaround for me. I hated Zelda when I was a kid, but then, when I started to grow up a little and like the games, I hated the main meat of them, in favor of the smaller side content the games offered. But now as an adult, I see the true potential of everything a Zelda game has to offer, and I don't think I could appreciate the game I do today without taking this long to truly get into it. Beating Twilight Princess for the first time was a weird task to me. I I clocked in about 23-ish hours when the credits finally rolled, and it hit me that this was the last mainline Zelda I had to beat to have finally experienced all of them. The irony in that situation being that Twilight Princess was my first Zelda game, but it ended up being the last to finish. And to be honest, it felt appropriate at the time, and it still does now. Twilight Princess is a strangely complex game to come to appreciate. In my opinion, it's the most inconsistent Zelda experience I've ever played. I'd go up to bat and argue that Skyward Sword of all games has a more consistent experience than Twilight Princess. This game was made at a time when Nintendo was very eager to please fans and win them back after so many left during the GameCube era, and this did bring back a lot of longtime Zelda fans while also creating new ones in the process. And for that, Twilight Princess 
test did its job. The lows may have been really, really low, but the highs of the game somehow made up for everything and created one of, if not the most memorable Zelda game to me, in an ironic sense. Its story, the characters, the dungeons, the music, mostly everything that needed to be right, ended up being the best it ever was, and in the end, carved out its own legacy rather than being Ocarina of Time 2, and in some aspects, surpassing it entirely. As I've stated before, the lowest score I can give any 3D Zelda game is a 9 out of 10, and Twilight Princess only further proved me correct. I don't usually give scores on my channel as if I were to give them out on my favorite games of all time, the scores would be wildly inconsistent, because I think judging a piece of art is far more nuanced than boiling it down to another number score, at least to me. Not every 10 out of 10 feels like a 10 out of 10, and I think that describes my time with Twilight Princess. By the time I was finished with the game, I was enthralled. Not to the extents of other Zelda games, perhaps, but dang, that game was something else. I I'm sure to bring this point up many other times when discussing my favorite games, but this is something my friend once told me. When you really love something, you're more than willing to overlook its flaws. It was something like that. I don't remember the exact wording. I try to make it sound catchier with great power comes great responsibility type thing, but it didn't just work out. But back to my point. I do think this holds very true and actually made me appreciate my favorite games more than I would have otherwise. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, my second favorite game of all time next to Xenoblade 3, has a ton of issues and breast tissues. But as a complete package, I love this game to absolute death, and I will die on that hill that the game is dang near perfect, which sounds contradictory knowing that I just said the game has a lot of issues and breast tissues, but it's mostly a perspective you can only learn if you really love something, and this game, despite its flaws, is near perfect to me. And that describes my experience with Twilight Princess to a T. Will I replay the game sometime in the near future? Most likely not, but my memories with this game will always stick with me, and that's worth a lot. But. Otherwise, that's all I have to say on Twilight Princess. If you liked the video, I highly recommend hitting that like and subscribe button. We're on the road to 1,000 subscribers, and I would love to see you all there. But otherwise, my name is Delonic, and I will see you all in the next video. Take it easy, and stay fresh.